Uh, good morning. My name is Mike Balboni, and I am the, um, one of the trustees for the New York Power Authority, and I chair the Committee on Cyber and Physical Security. I would like to welcome the committee members who are participating by video today, uh, Chairman John Comel, uh, Gene Nicandri, Tracy McGibbon, and Dennis Trainer. I'd also like to welcome the uh, New York Power Authority staff and the members who are present. Uh, this is a scheduled committee meeting which has been duly noticed as required by the Open Meetings Law. And I now call the regular meeting of the committee to order pursuant to Section B4 of the Cyber and Physical Security Committee Charter. We would begin with the adoption of the agenda. I ask whether the committee members have had any, uh, have any amendments to the proposed agenda. Yeah. I ask for a motion to approve the agenda in that case. Second. All right. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 All right. <clears throat> so the uh, motion to be adopted, uh, it has been adopted. So the next portion of the meeting will be held in executive session. The meeting will resume in approximately 10 minutes. Uh, I would ask for a motion to conduct the, this executive session pursuant to public officer's law. <laughs> Section 105 to discuss matters regarding public safety and security. So moved. So moved. Ask for a second. Second. Right. We, are, we are now in executive session. I'd like to ask for a motion to resume um, meeting in open session. So, so moved. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. 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 So, uh, so we are now back in open session. I like to state that during the executive session, no votes were taken. And now I'd like to put before the subcommittee a consent agenda, which consists of routine housekeeping items and is now before the trustees for adoption. I'd like to ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. I'd like to ask Kenneth Carnes, the uh, in Chief Information Security Office Officer, to make his presentation. All right. Good morning again, Chairman, uh, Committee Chair Balboni, and Trustees. Uh, as you know, I'm Casey Carnes, the VP of Critical Secure Services and Chief Information Security Officer of the Authority here. Uh, today, I'm excited to discuss, uh, you know, some of the things that are, you know, threats that we see things that we see targeting utilities, things happening in the industry, and things that we have in our plan for 2019 investment to improve and continue to stay proactive and ahead of the curve into 2019 and beyond. Um, there was an article released literally on January 17th from Forbes, and it was titled, The Chief Information Security Officer Priorities for 2019. I want to highlight a couple of those. Uh, number one was gain of visibility across all platforms. As you're aware, we've been investing in visibility significantly since 2017 and making sure that we have capability to see uh, throughout our environment. Uh, understanding the new perimeter. Uh, we understand that the identity is the new perimeter. As we go more digital, we're going to have to have more and more endpoints, and we don't have the historical single edge entry point that we've had uh, to deal with in the past. Uh, nurture a culture of security. If you're aware, we've uh, revamped our entire security awareness program and we're pushing a program of NIPA Secure. Uh, number four is the one I like most, though. Align security operations and IT operations. Uh, they're saying that's a priority for 2019. I think it's fantastic that we saw that coming and we made our IT organization changes uh, back in October where we did exactly that. We moved the IT operations, combined it with the network operations group, our security operations group in our ISOC, and then also the IT ops uh, functions, compute servers and everything are now incorporated with our cybersecurity. So we're truly baking it in. And also then addressing rests inside the firewall and managing security in the cloud, which we're gonna continue to monitor and leverage. So if you look at what we have going on, I really just wanna highlight, there's a lot on here, but I wanna highlight really the four main areas and the partnerships that we leverage and that we're not doing this alone. So monitoring, you know, we have our internal program that we've built out, but we also leverage external scanning, automated indicators, and leverage our partners. And we do things that are both internal and external to make sure we're looking at it from all directions and if the threat changes that we have visibility into that. Uh, we have partnerships across the board, state, local, federal, industry. Uh, we have research R&D capabilities 
We partner with our state homeland security. We're working on some efforts with our state national guard for cyber mutual aid and also the state security working group where we completed a drill uh, with the New York State ISO uh, late last year. Uh, information sharing is continuous. That is how cyber works, right? That's how we know what others are seeing, what's targeting us, and how do we make sure our environment is seeing everything we want to see and any targeting that's pointed towards us. And then sector-specific industries, obviously the Electric Subsector Coordinating Council, the Electric Power Research Institute, and NERC, our regulator for the bulk electric system. So exercises. We have to look at all risks when it comes to cyber because any risk could technically escalate from a cyber basis. So a plant outage, a grid outage, anything like that. So we're doing those as all hazards drills, which means, you know, that's why we partner with emergency management, physical security, IT and OT, to make sure that we've got complete capability escalation and response in place for any scenario whether it's generated from a cyber attack or a weather event or anything else. Uh, we also focus on training, getting our staff trained, and making sure that we're competent and up-to-date on what's going on in the industry and what's targeting uh, NIPA and or industrial control systems. We were uh, significantly blessed to partner with the Department of Energy in the past uh, Liberty Eclipse drill. Uh, that drill took on a new mode last fall when they partnered with DARPA to uh, look at a black start scenario drill under cyber attack. Uh, we're gonna continue to partner with them into the future and we're gonna participate and we are on the planning group uh, to support GridX, which is a biannual drill that is completed by the Electric Sector Information Sharing Analysis Center. That is a subset of NERC. That is the uh, entity that runs the drill, but it's a national drill utilities can play and you can be an observer or participant or otherwise we are going to participate in the next one in November and we will be partnering uh, with the state uh, to increase the capability and response also there and then assessments you know we understand we want everybody to understand that you know you're not trusting what I'm saying that how we're doing so we do assessments internally externally we do pen testing we do purple team exercises. We do other exercises to verify our environment and our security posture throughout NIPA. So I really want to highlight uh, 2019 look ahead, predictions and things to watch. New zero trust models. A zero trust is actually an old Forrester model. It came out in 2010. It was kind of ahead of its time at, at, at that moment. Uh, technology hadn't caught up with it to be able to uh, build it into our environment. We're really pushing that this year with segmentation and micro segmentation, but you're going to be more and more models that basically the zero trust model is I don't trust this device. I don't trust this user. I don't trust anything. I'm going to confirm and verify everything that I can in my environment. Uh, managed service provider attacks. If you recall, uh, the DHS indicted some, uh, you know, FBI indicted some uh, managed service providers or attackers towards managed service providers like Samantha and others. Uh, earlier this year. That is going to continue as we, you know, leverage more and more cloud services and things like that. We have to make sure we're managing that vendor uh, partnership and also doing that through our supply chain process. So increasing our vendor uh, risk management, our vendor controls, and also our cyber risk assessment processes and everything we buy and implement uh, at the authority. Uh, AI-based attacks uh, will continue to grow as machines uh, get more and more capable to carry on attacks and take what they've learned from the feedback and adjust and continue to modify. I think this is the conversation of man versus machine or machine versus machine type attacks. We will definitely be focused on making sure that we have the machine capabilities with the human interaction to confirm that will support and guide the intel that we collect in our environment. And the nation state actions. Uh, have been in the press over and over from adversaries of the U.S. So where's our investments really focus? Uh, we have three main areas that we're focusing in 2019. ITOT visibility, so increasing that visibility even further. We have some innovative pilots there and some things we're going to do that I can't, uh, unfortunately, talk about in the public session here. But there are some really interesting things that we're doing to increase that visibility in our environment to make sure that we can see any attack or any uh, intrusion of any type uh, as we operate our environments.
Uh, segmentation, that's building on that zero trust model that we're, we're definitely buying in on that idea and creating these risk-based micro segments. So if you take the idea of uh, a honeycomb or something like that, you know, you can have a big open area or you actually can break tiny segments. So critical data, segment A, critical data, segment B. And if somebody would ever get into a segment, the risk is reduced because you're not able to exfil all of it at once or gain access to a different segment easily. Uh, and access anywhere is really enhancing our digital worker and making sure that we're pushing uh, the capabilities of technology uh, in our digital vision and making sure it's delivering what people are looking for and providing the security as a basis in all of that work. So what's really changing? And this is, uh, this is an interesting slide. Uh, sorry, the colors I have are a not question. Mine. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, if Absolutely. I can ask a question before we yes. go on to the yes, next slide. Um, can we go back? I, I, obviously, yes, I think sorry. it's great what we're doing um, in terms of our cooperation in all these areas with other utilities, other agencies, other partners in government. Um, I think it'd be useful for us to also, at some point in the future, it doesn't have to be now, have a more detailed discussion about what we're doing internally within NIPA, uh, with our employees and how we're educating the cyber risks that come from inside and outside. It, um, I, I, I'd like to suggest uh, maybe at some point in the future that we have that. I'd like to hear more about what you're doing um, internally um, to educate all of our employees because, you know, we're only as strong as, you know, those of us, you know, the, the weakest person inside. And so it, it would be helpful for us to be able to get an understanding of where we are and what your practice, your team, how you're educating um, the rest of NIPA about these kinds of risks and how we're protecting against them. So, Trustee yeah, McGibbon, can... you have uh, you have touched upon the the exact um, cause for concern. You know what what Casey's discussing now, obviously, is the architecture of security for the uh, for our organization. But what you've touched upon is obviously the human element, and there's more and more attention focusing on that. It's through things like you know phishing uh, tests to see who will open up. A um, you know a, a, a link and then possibly infect with malware. It's about understanding the awareness of the entire system, the operating system, and what's what's really interesting is that a lot of people believe that this workforce that we have now, the millennial workforce, uh, understands data a lot. And in fact, there are all sorts of studies that that refer to the the danger of individuals not understanding the risks associated with this. So you are absolutely correct. And um, Casey, I want to work with you and your team to let's, uh, for the trustees, let's lay out what types of programs. I know that you have programs and you're doing a lot of work on this now, but I want to see if we can possibly, you know, develop something separately on that topic. Absolutely, we can do that. And I can give you one, uh, you know, quick quirk on what we do have. We have a program called NIPA Secure which uh, we're pushing and building as a uh, second only to safety in our culture and trying to make sure that our employees are aware of security. And we do, uh, you know, phishing tests. We do targeted phishing tests. We make sure that we do programs and uh, roadshows to educate staff, do attend their staff meetings to help them be educated. So we're doing a lot there and I can definitely give you the full details. That would be great, thanks. Yep. Anything else? I will proceed. So with uh, this slide, I did not control the colors. It is a slide from uh, the SANS Institute. It was created uh, by an individual named Rob Lee, who's uh, known in the ICS community. Uh, his view is from a, an intelligence view uh, as a past uh, NSA analyst. So this, actu this really shows kind of a scale of where a capability is in an, in an environment or a, a defensive posture in cybersecurity. So architecture, everybody's doing that, right? You design an architecture, you build something, you put some controls in place and you try to prevent access and put security things in place like firewalls and other defenses just to make sure that you've got standard cyber security designed in. Passive defense is really, oh, I have an IDS and I get some information, but I don't really act, take a lot of action on that. Somebody's got to review it. They got to go implement some change. That is where most businesses kind of end because they don't see a value in greater investment into cybersecurity around, you know, that's their basis. Architecture and passive defenses, oh, we have cybersecurity, we're good. At NIPA, we know that uh, as, a, as a New York entity, as a utility, we're a target, uh, that's not good enough. And so last year we invested a lot in developing capabilities, uh, skills, and 
training of staff to move into the focus of active defense. And that's not attack back, but what that means is really uh, taking a proactive position, knowing your environment, studying your environment, and doing threat hunting and things like that in your environment to understand who's attacking you, how they're attacking you, and how they may be trying to gain uh, entry into your environment or move in an environment. So we're really going to continue to move in that focus, and we're going to continue to push towards the edge of intelligence uh, in the future because we really want to be uh, not just leveraging and waiting for somebody else from the federal government or a partner or something like that to provide an IOC that we go, oh, that's interesting, we'll take a look. We want to be generating those uh, as part of our daily operations. So we're definitely pushing more and more of our capabilities and skills and training into becoming more of an intelligence shop in how do we operate and gather our environment and make sure that we're making human good decisions based on all the uh, events and data. And so how we plan to do that, if you're familiar with the cyber kill chain, it's basically uh, an old model that says, you know, as an attacker moves into your environment, you know, they have to do some reconnaissance, they've got to weaponize their attack, they've got to deliver that, they've got to go into exploitation because now they're in your environment. Well, that's all well and good. And if we take the idea and the model that it's not an if but when, we want to make sure that we have that visibility. We don't want to have a position where we get a notification from somebody else that, hey, we see this weird thing happening from your environment. So we want to make sure we stay ahead of that curve and that we stay knowledgeable about everything that we own and operate to make sure our environment stays secure and uh, resilient. So we're leveraging a uh, model designed by MITER. MITER is a, uh, a DOD uh, contractor, but it's down in the kill chain. It's focused on the tactics, techniques, and procedures of an adversary, basically their tradecraft of cyber entry and, and mitigation. And we're designing a security control implementation strategy around that on what controls give us that visibility. So if ever uh, something is in our environment that we're not expecting or that shouldn't be there, uh, we would get the notifications and have the visibility to stop it before they can execute or control anything, right? So that's ultimately where we're building to and building that into our environment. And it's a very complex, very large model. But if you look at any industrial control system attack that has been instigated from, you know, Havocs and Ukraine or anywhere else, it can be mapped into the attack model on how they did it. And so for us, it's really building that into our environment, into our daily posture, into our processes, to ensure that we have visibility no matter what threats might be or how they change. So the example there is, is that, you know, if it's zero days, so if you take Stuxnet, for example, leveraged four windows zero days to be successful, all of our current defenses don't matter because you don't have indicators, you don't have signatures, you don't have all these other things. But every one of those could have been stopped at various stages in the uh, attack model kill chain. So we're definitely uh, leveraging that to make sure that we could get that visibility across our platforms. You know, Casey, just to, to follow up, um, when you look at the kill chain, what uh, Tracy McGibbon talked about beforehand in terms of the personnel, they have to be informed that they are an essential part of stopping you know, uh, the kill chain, that, that they are the ones who can help stop uh, the weaponization of the malware. And that's why, again, why it's so important to work with uh, uh, our personnel. Absolutely. We, uh, we push that a lot in training on, you know, I had an old presentation that I used to use all the time where something, somebody clicked and not at NIPA, but they clicked, they clicked again, they clicked again, six seconds. There were seven controls there to stop that. The last one stopped it was the firewall back outbound. Three of them were cybersecurity controls, firewalls, policy, other controls. The other three, all human performance. Person clicked, right. person clicked person clicked. So I agree that is a key area for us to make sure that we're educating and training individuals around their role in helping secure our environment. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? All right. Well, well done, team. Yeah, Casey, Rob, everyone, well done. Keep doing. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, there are no votes necessary at this time for uh, this item. And um, our next scheduled committee meeting is set for July 30th, 2019. And I would ask for a motion to close this meeting. So moved. Second. 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 All those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. We are we are concluded. Thank you very much, Casey. <clears throat>